I'm Dr. Sam and this is Dr. Sam's Help. In my previous videos I started a series of communications on different macronutrients and we already spoke about carbohydrates, we spoke about lipids, actually both fat and cholesterol and today it's time to talk about the third and in my opinion the most essential uh, macronutrient which is protein. First of all I'd like to say that in my previous videos when we were talking about carbohydrates and lipids I kind of made it clear that we don't really need carbohydrates we uh, do need fat to a certain extent and it's a good molecule that allows you allows us to store energy and there are some fats or fatty acids and fatty fat soluble uh, vitamins that are actually essential for our survival so we do need some fat and it's not the case uh, with protein we need protein it is literally an essential uh, type of macronutrients and we'll get to it so today my plan is to cover the most essential information about proteins what these are what do we need them for what happens to them when we consume them and one important question is obviously how much protein do we need so the very first question is what is protein uh, there is definitely a good academic definition of uh, uh, proteins from the standpoint of biochemistry but I will give you mine which is definitely non-academic but it's very simple I would define protein or proteins as a very versatile group of molecules uh, that we can describe as amino acids uh, and their combinations. I think it cannot get easier or simpler than that and again it's not an academic definition uh, but I think it serves our purposes really well. So amino acids are the simplest forms of proteins. Uh, they are single molecules of blocks that we can build the more complex proteins from. There are 20 uh, well-known amino acids. Uh, I assume that there are technically there might be more um, from this like, chemical standpoint, but from the biological standpoint, we only need to know about 20. And uh, what, what we can do with these amino acids is uh, we can either use them directly to create different um, structures in our body or use them as uh, precursors for certain uh, neuromediators, hormones, and so on. For example, serotonin is one of the neuromediators in our uh, brain that actually in the whole body that regulates number of processes but is really well known for its role in mood regulation. And this neuromediator, this, is, this chemical, is uh, made of an amino acid called uh, tryptophan. And it's been converted into 5-hydroxytryptophan uh, and 5-hydroxytryptamine, which we know as, uh, as serotonin. So these 20 amino acids are very simple molecules, and uh, our body in 99% of cases doesn't use just uh, amino acids. Usually it, what it does, it takes amino acids, it connects them together uh, using something that's called peptide bond. Uh, again, we don't need to get into the like, chemical uh, definitions of what peptide bond is. It's just like some term that I, I, I feel like introducing today. Uh, but uh, as a result of this peptide bond, we, we, can, we create, our body creates molecules called peptides. So we've got two of them, it's called dipeptide. We've got three of them, we've got tripeptide and so on. Uh, but usually we use uh, terms like oligopeptide when there are few amino acids uh, or polypeptide when there are multiple amino acids linked together. Uh, the reason why we use oligo and polypeptide terms or peptide in general just because usually unless you are like a chemist no one really cares about the number of molecules included in the protein structure. A good example would be something that we know uh, as insulin which is a protein or peptide hormone which has uh, two chains A and B and one of them has 21 amino acids connected another one has 30 amino acids connected in the uh, peptide chain and as a result we've got a complex molecule that has two chains and 51 amino acids in them but uh, anyone who is not particularly interested in number of uh, molecules there would call it uh, just a polypeptide or peptide or protein one important thing I would like to mention is you definitely have heard about our DNA that encodes uh, pretty much everything in our bodies. But I would like to uh, make a special point that the only thing that DNA encodes is the protein structure. I think it really shows how important and how essential and crucial uh, the protein structure and protein in general is for our survival. 
Another important thing I would like to mention is the fact that uh, approximately half of these amino acids, uh, uh, 8 to 10 of them, are essential, which simply means that we cannot produce them ourselves. We have to get them from the uh, environment through our nutrition. There are 8 to 10 of them depending on the sources, uh, and uh, there is a little bit of confusion in them, but uh, the story is actually way simpler than it seems. So 8 amino acids are completely essential. So we, there is no other way of getting them than, cons than consuming them with food. Uh, two others, specifically arginine and histidine, sometimes are included into this list and sometimes are not, just because uh, they are, we normally we, we get enough of them uh, and uh, they become essential only, only at these very specific points in our development or life in general. Uh, specifically when, when there are like growth spurts, when we are working out really, really hard, like the bodybuilders, um, arginine and histidine would be definitely essential for them, or when we are recovering from some serious illness and there is increased turnover of protein. So uh, it doesn't really matter which ones uh, are essential. There are certain like mnemonics and like, acronyms that allow medical students to memorize them. I don't see any practicality in it, but I just wanted you to know that approximately half of the amino acids that uh, that are they exist in our bodies are actually essential, and pretty much half of the protein we just like simply cannot survive without consuming a certain amount of protein on a regular basis. So, what happens to protein when we consume it? Uh, the story is actually quite similar. Uh, to other macronutrients. So what happens with food in general, we mulch it in our mouth, then it gets to our stomach and the, uh, all food is getting exposed to like highly chemically aggressive environment. Uh, the, acid, the acidity, the, the stomach juice that uh, breaks down the, the food and then it gets to our duodenum and then this food, like smaller chunks of it, uh, gets exposed to the uh, proteolytic enzymes of pancreas. So we spoke about uh, different enzymes that pancreas produce, produces and uh, one group of enzymes that pancreas is making is something that's called proteases, which simply means the enzyme that breaks down protein into uh, singular amino acids. So obviously it's a critical part of the digestion of uh, protein where a protein gets converted into or broken down into uh, simple amino acids. These simple amino acids have been then absorbed um, in our gut into our bloodstream and been distributed across all the tissues that need them. And here is a huge difference between proteins and uh, the rest of macronutrients. We actually had an effective way of storing them. So, for example, we were talking about uh, sugar, so glucose. Glucose can be converted into glycogen and stored into tissues until a certain amount. After that, if we exceed this uh, amount, we've got our glycogen storage is full, glucose has been converted into fat, and fat has been stored with other fats, uh, excessive fats, as a fatty tissue. That's pretty straightforward. We don't have such uh, storage facility or mechanism uh, for proteins. So effectively, our body has to do something with all the protein that we get, and that brings us to the next question. What, what do our bodies do with the protein that we get, and why do we need protein? So this is a very important question that I think is, the, is critical for us. Everything in our bodies is composed of protein. Pretty much all tissues have protein as the main structural element and as the main functional element. All our enzymes, all our uh, majority of our hormones, uh, different uh, biologically active substances, all pretty much all structural elements of our body are proteins. A good example would be collagen, which is the base of our um, of our connective tissue, actin and myosin in our muscles that create the 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 contractile elements of our muscle that allow us to actually uh, use our muscles and so on. Our life would simply be not possible without, without protein. And one important thing is that our body uh, always kind of recycles 
uh, the, the, our protein. So there is always some sort of a breakdown of proteins and some sort of a remodeling of existing proteins or building of new ones. So usually we break down around 300 to 500 grams of protein a day and accordingly we have to build another three to five hundred grams of protein uh, again. So what happens with the protein that was broken down is majority of cases uh, it's been broken down into single amino acids which have been then uh, recycled, reused in order to create new proteins. During this process some uh, amino acids have been degraded to the point when we cannot uh, reintroduce them into protein turnover. And this amount varies, but usually we're talking about 80 to 120 grams of amino acids. And these amino acids have to be replenished from external sources. And uh, that is the main reason why we have to consume protein. So the last question I would like to cover today is like, how much protein do we need? So the simple answer would be this 80 to 120 grams of protein that we get from uh, uh, our nutrition in order to replace this uh, 80 to 120 grams of uh, amino acids that have been completely irreversibly degraded in our uh, body on a daily basis. Unfortunately, this explanation or number would be a huge oversimplification. The problem is that when we consume our food, the composition of this food is not always matching the needs of our body. So, for example, we can get some food that 20% of, uh, of the protein in this food will, will be composed of um, essential amino acids, whereas we will need like 50 to 70 percent of essential amino acids in order to replace the ones that have been lost. So uh, it will be a huge problem. We'll, we'll need to take more food, uh, more protein in order to compensate for that. And uh, we'll end up being in a situation when we consumed uh, too much protein and our body will literally will not know what to do with this protein. And it's a little bit problematic to actually get rid of protein. Uh, it puts an extra load in our liver that uh, usually runs lots of like these biochemical transformations and it will definitely put a huge uh, burden on our kidneys. Uh, sometimes maybe you have heard that you know some bodybuilders when they're consuming a lot of protein they have they develop certain kidney problems. I'm not planning to get into like lots of details about the biochemistry of uh, separate amino acids matching nutrition to the uh, demand of our body today, uh, but I would like just to mention that the typical amount of um, protein, the recommended amount of protein that an adult should consume on a daily basis is around 0.8 grams of protein uh, per one kilogram of body mass or another number would be 0 0.36 gram of protein per pound of body weight. These are the international recommendations for uh, just regular people, but when we are losing weight, when we are following specific diets, when we are working out, if we are athletes or bodybuilders, uh, the requirements might change drastically and there are sometimes requirement to or recommendation to consume up to 2 grams of protein per, uh, per kilo. Some bodybuilders consume ridiculous amounts of protein, like way higher than that. Uh, but as I said, I think it will be a good uh, topic for a separate discussion for a separate video uh, and I will definitely cover it. Uh, I'm happy that we covered the essentials today and uh, I've got one major topic for macronutrients and I hope that in my next video I will actually mm, I will complete this series on uh, macronutrients. So technically it's a carbohydrate uh, but I believe that alcohol holds a very special place and it's quite different from carbohydrates it does affect the way we think, it does affect our behavior, it does affect our metabolism in a variety of ways, and I think it deserves a special discussion as part five of our micronutrients review. So definitely see you in my next video, and uh, I wish you all the best. Please don't forget to subscribe, if to like the video if you liked it, Please ask your questions. Uh, give me some ideas on what you would like to, what you would like me to talk about, and definitely check out my website, drsamshealth.com, uh, for some tools, stories, blogs, uh, lots of useful information there. All the best.